Good evening and welcome to Spooky South Coast. Tim Weisberg here, along with the silent assassin Matt Costa. It's just the two of us. That's terrible. I shouldn't sing on the radio. But uh, it is just the two of us tonight. The science advisor Matt Moniz is out. Stephanie Burke is uh, at an event with Dustin Perry. They're uh, out in Middleborough. So you have just the silent assassin and myself tonight. Matt, did you want me to take this out of mono so that nothing fires off? Okay, I don't know why your microphone's not working. That was happening yesterday. Let's see. Oh, so it's just misnumbered? Try again? No, it looks like they just disconnected your microphone. That's that's helpful. That's totally helpful. Should I take it out of this? Now see? How about now? Yeah. There we go. There we oh, go. Okay, all right. See, see what happens when we start messing around with things. <laughs> but that's all right because well, we get we get crazy and or and we start punching buttons. Sometimes we punch the wrong. Oh, the, the the spooky South Coast audience just doesn't understand what we've been doing, what we've been uh, putting on here over the last couple of weeks, really. And I say we, but when I say we, I mean you. You've been doing all the work. It's, it's a collab. It's. I, we always say that I'm the idea person and you're the one that puts the ideas into action, but you've been coming at me with all the ideas. When you're like, what, what if we do this? What if we try this? I think we can do this. And then it just gets crazier and crazier. But it's working. We have the streaming video now, like permanently secured. I'm not going yep. to start talking about how it's foolproof because we all know what happened last week. Exactly. When I started yep. talking about that. But it's easier. I'll say that much. It's easier. And we have more streaming things here at WBSM. So if you are a fan of WBSMs, all you have to do is go to the YouTube channel for WBSM and subscribe. Are they sending out automatic notices when they go on, when they go live? Um, if you're subscribed to the WBSM right, YouTube. Right, the WBSM. Yep. I know we do. Yep. Our, our spooky South Coast one does, but... I, get, I must not be subscribed to the WBSM one because I haven't been getting the notifications. So I'll have to make sure I do that. Because, mm. you know, Spooky South Coast, we, we blow them away in subscribers. We do. We do. We're, uh, we're, we're, we're getting up there now. But we right. could always use more. We're, we're actually um, um, on the road to 2000. So if you are a Spooky South Coast fan, if you're a listener, if you're a regular, maybe a podcast downloader, or maybe you watch the YouTube videos later on, or the different ways that we put up the show... Subscribe to us right there on YouTube, and then you'll see when we go live, and you'll know that you can jump in and join in the conversation, which you can do at any point during the show as well by calling in at 508-996-0500, 877-996-1420. If for some reason you still pay long-distance charges and you want to call in toll-free, you can do it that way. And we have the chat room going at Spooky TV at SpookySouthCoast.com and the app, the Spooky South Coast app, the easiest way to get the show. You can put it right on your smartphone. And wherever you go, you'll have Spooky South Coast with you. And if for some reason you can't get the app to work, there's always the YouTube app as well. You can get us there. So many ways to consume the show. Oh, and as the guy who's been putting out reminders to everybody at the station of how to promote the YouTube, you think I'd know how to do it myself. If you have a smart TV with the YouTube app, you can watch us that way. Hmm. If you have a streaming device like a Roku or a Chromecast or one of those, you can watch us that way via the YouTube app. And if you have a Comcast Xfinity cable box, you know, one of the, the big, I guess it's silver, the big silver box. If you have one of those, they now have the YouTube ne YouTube app installed into the cable box. So if you just go to where it oh, says wow. apps, yeah. you know, a lot of people have discovered that they can watch Netflix now through the cable box. Well, you can watch YouTube as well. So just go to the YouTube app on your Xfinity cable box and search for Spooky South Coast in the YouTube app and you'll find our channel. And I think you can bookmark it and everything through that app as well. That's great. There's no excuses. No, really. Nope. I mean, unless like you're like, I don't stay home on Saturday yeah, night. So. But even if you're like, reason, even yeah. if you're out in the club, as the kids say, <laughs> in the club, yep. you can just open up the, the YouTube app on your phone or the spooky South coast app on your phone and watch us. Although I don't know why you'd want to be doing that at a club, but you're not, gonna be able to, you're, not, well, you're not gonna be able to hear it. No. Bring your Bluetooth headphones. I don't even know if that would make a difference. Not that I have much of a much experience in the club. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
The only club I belong to is Club Spooky, and we get together every Saturday night. So, uh, again, as I mentioned, you can call in, you can join in on the chat room, you can tweet us using the hashtag SpookyLive or directly at SpookySC. There's so many different ways. You can email us, SpookyCrew at SpookySouthCoast.com. So many different ways to get in touch with us during the show. And a little bit later on, we're going to be joined by our guest for tonight, Dr. Andrea Akita. She's a folklorist. She she's she's a doctor too, Matt. So this is two weeks in a row right. that we've classed up the joint we've really by bringing up, in some yeah. ac- academics. So uh, but she'll be joining us in just a little bit. We're going to talk about folklore. We're going to talk about the supernatural. We're going to talk about the paranormal, and we're going to talk about Slenderman because we really haven't discussed Slenderman in great depth, and that's an area of interest for Dr. Kita. So we'll be talking about that with her as well coming up a little bit later on. One of the things that uh, you know, we get tagged in a lot of stuff. Uh, we get we, Spooky South Coast and all of us individually. You know, people keep seeing stuff popping up all the time on the show. And uh, and they always they always make sure that they let us know about it. They share it with us. They tag us in it on Facebook. They tweet it to us. And uh, so we're not going to have a Week in Weird this week because our Week in Weird correspondent ditched us for the second week in a row. Yeah, that's that's fine. I guess we just have to deal with that. But uh, there was some there was a story that I want to talk about, something that had been coming in uh, over the last week, couple of weeks. And I'm just trying to find the tweet where it was. <laughs> Matt, what was the big story? You follow along on, stu- on this stuff. What was the big story that everybody was sending to us? Um, I'm not sure. Sh- I don't know. I know I, I saw something um, about Yuri Gelly the other day. Oh, and you also you, you took a little bit of a beating by sharing something about Uri Geller. People, oh yeah, yeah. People are like, hasn't this guy been ex- uh, been explained to be a fraud? Oh, this this is this is the story that I was looking at. This is the one that I wanted right. to bring up. You had it, and a number of people sent it to us. So, being president, part of being president is that you. Uh, are involved in the nomination of federal judges and president Donald Trump has appointed, uh, has nominated for Alabama's federal district. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm assuming that this is somebody who will be replacing, um, a judge Roy Moore who is running for the Senate. So anyway, he, there's a, a federal spot open in Alabama and the nomination from president Trump was a guy named Brett Talley. Now, Brett, Pal- Brett Talley failed to disclose that he was married to a White House lawyer, so there might be a conflict of interest, and also he's only 36 years old, so people are a l- little bit worried about whether or not he has the experience to be a federal judge. The fact that he's also worked as a horror novelist and ghost hunter, people feel like that should be something that weighs against him. So... Brett Talley has never shied away from this. You know, he, he doesn't he doesn't hide from it. Uh, he actually says uh, in, in 2014, he did a, an interview no. at the Washington Post. Nor should he. Right. He talked about uh, working with the Tuscaloosa Paranormal Research Group. Uh, he talked about uh, some of the work that he's done. And he said, this is a direct quote that he told the Washington Post. I tend to believe that there's a good scientific explanation for the weird things people see and hear. But I'm open to the idea. And it's fun. And so we talked about how they go about the process and all that. And so there's this question, I guess, from some people who are saying, well, do we want this guy to be a federal judge if this is what his hobby is? Mm -hmm. And you know firsthand, you've seen it, it goes right up my rear when people want to take what we do and what we're interested in and use it against us in some way. As if somehow, because this is what we pursue as as a hobby, as an area of interest, there's something wrong with us. Right. I mean, last week we had a college professor on talking about the paranormal. Tonight we're going to have a, a college professor who's a doctor mm-hmm. talking about the paranormal. We've had very many academics over the years. I've had conversations with a Nobel Prize winning physicist over the paranormal. Like, these are people who, they have some cachet behind what it is that they do. It's not like they're just, you know, Joe Schmo ghost hunter. Right. I mean, there should be a um, negative connotation associated with ghost hunting or paranormal investigation. 
but um i could see i could see why people would question a judge because it is um the paranormal i guess is a belief system but i i suppose that's true but at the same time it's not like he's saying that everything that they encounter is mm-hmm. real either right i mean it would be another another thing if he was coming out and saying ghosts are legitimately real and yeah and you and have if, to believe in them yeah, and, and and i'm going to allow them in my courtroom as as mm-hmm. evidence you know but, but just I, yeah i don't think it's going to um affect how um what do you call it? Wait, you mean you don't think it'll his, affect his, like his decisions? His, yeah, it won't like, affect him when yeah, he's actually yeah. on the bench. Well, one of the one of the things that I think is uh, uh, the problem with this is the connotation of using a, a term like ghost hunter. You know, if they had said you know uh, Brett Talley is a noted paranormal skeptic, then people might be like, oh well, of course he's going out there and telling these people how they're wrong for running around in the dark looking for ghosts. So yes, we fully support that. But the, look, just I'm just saying, with all the stuff that's been coming out in the news over the last couple of weeks, there are worse things that a guy who is seeking a, a certain position could do than running around in the dark looking for ghosts. You know, I don't right. think any of these ghosts have come forward and said that Brett Talley has sexually assaulted them. <laughs> so he's got one up over Roy Moore. Mm-hmm. He's got one up over a number of people in politics and entertainment right now. So, And I think, uh, like, across the, the nation, there's... A widespread belief that, uh, I mean, I think a, l- a lot of people do believe in some sort of paranormal uh, activity. Right, but that's the thing that I've noticed is as much as the belief has grown mm-hmm. in it, we we are cool with us believing in it, but we don't want to have other people believing in it. You know, like right. it's cool if we believe in it. It's cool for us, but we don't want to think that our judges and our politicians and our president and anybody else believes in it either. So I was going to say, I shared, um, I, I shared a, uh, an infograph the, the other day from the Chapman university, uh, with some, uh, paranormal belief statistics. Oh yeah. We, every couple of years we get some new yeah, ones yeah. out. What, what's, uh, what are some um, of the numbers? They always change it up a little bit. It's not just like who believes in ghosts or, um, aliens. They, they always give like a, a little bit more of a, a definition. Um, but uh, 52% of the the people that they asked, which I think it's, it was 1,000 people, I think they asked, um, places can be haunted by spirits. 52% uh, percent of people uh, believe that that was true. So that's a that's a pretty good number of people. That's, mm-hmm. you know, um, I guess 520 out of 1,000. 25% uh, believe people can move objects with their mind. And Bigfoot got shafted this year. Only really? Only 16% believe in bigfoot now is, is that a drop in bigfoot beliefs I, I feel like it is i feel like it's a larger should be a See, larger I would, number i would think the bigfoot belief numbers are going up because bigfoot mm-hmm. has become kind of the the go-to trend in in the paranormal maybe all these tv shows about finding bigfoot and shooting bigfoot and killing bigfoot and marrying bigfoot and i want to who wants to marry a bigfoot and <laughs> you know who wants to be a millionaire bigfoot all these different shows that are out there now mm-hmm. i don't really watch a lot of them so i'm not sure of the exact titles but i think because right. you're you're one of the one of those people. Uh, well, I'd, I'd say I'm one of the 16%. <laughs> yeah. I'd say that I believe that there's something to it. I just don't know what it is exactly. But I'm definitely in the 52% that think that there's... Now, right. there's 52%, peop, 52% of people think that a place can be haunted? Yes. Because I would say, if somebody asked me that question, like, do you think a place can be haunted? I would say, yes. Well, it says myself. Ha- haunted by spirit, so... I mean, could it be haunted by something else? Well, no, but I mean, I, I, there's a difference to me between having a haunting and having a ghost experience. So I would be curious to to wonder how many people would answer the question just straight out. Do you believe in the existence of ghosts? You know, a lot of these times with polls, you have to be careful because polls are kind of molded. Yeah. The questions are molded in a way where they're, they're trying to get a, a specific answer out of you. But if they were saying... To people, how many of you believe in the existence of ghosts? I bet you it would be higher than 52%. Because a haunting gives you, if, if you think about it, and if you're like us and you research it and you pay attention to it, the idea of a haunting is the idea that there's many spirits or 
uh, you know, a, a number of incidents over time. And then it has to be something that happens frequently. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a haunting. Just having a ghost pop into your house one day doesn't mean your house is haunted. You know, your house is haunted if you don't feel comfortable, if it's, if it's something that is weighing on your family, if it's something that's getting in the way of you living your day-to-day -day life, that's right. a haunting. But if it's just every once in a while I see something walking down the hallway, I, I wouldn't consider that to be haunting. I would just consider that to be paranormal activity. Right. I, th I think I'd have to agree. There's probably more people who, are, who say that they've encountered something like a ghost that they can't or something that they can't explain of that nature. Right. Um, as opposed to like, my house is definitely haunted or. Yeah, that question, if the question was posed that way, you know, have you ever had a ghostly experience? Have you ever encountered a ghost? Do you believe that ghosts exist? I bet you it would be higher than 52%. I mean, I've seen oh, some yeah, polls definitely. where belief in ghosts is in the 70s to 80s in, in percentages. I mean, and that's, I've got to think that that's probably more common now than it was even when we started doing the show you know, 12 years ago. I think that what we've seen now is people willing to say, okay, there's, there's gotta be something to all of this. Mm -hmm. So yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I believe that they exist. And before, you know, let's just say it was the year 2000 and they did that poll mm -hmm. and they asked that question. Do you believe in ghosts? I think you would get a percentage of people answering it that had a ghostly experience, and that's why they would believe it. And I think now you probably have a good section of people that would answer that, that would say yes, that would answer in the affirmative, but never had an actual experience themselves. So that's that's where we're kind of expanding, expanding that gap a little bit, is that we're saying you don't necessarily have to have an experience anymore to believe in the possibility of having that experience, which is a good thing. Right. I'm, I'm <laughs> for it. Whatever it is, I'm Whatever against it. it. <laughs> so uh, we'll be joined in just a few minutes by our guest, Dr. Andrea Akita. And I just want to remind everybody that during the course of the night, as we, as we discuss the different topics, you can call in at 508-996-0500-877-996-1420. We do not relegate questions during the show to just one portion of the interview. Uh, you know, we do like to have a little bit of an establishment of the conversation at the beginning, but... You know, at any time, if a question pops up in your mind, you can send it off in the chat room. You can call in with it. The one thing about the chat room tonight is I'm trying to monitor it as best I can. But, right. uh, you know, I'm also talking to the guests as well. So I will try to get to as many of them as I can. But we were talking about some things that we might be doing in the future uh, with, with Patreon and some other ideas. And, and mm -hmm. one of the things you would talked about was a, a super chat option. Oh, right. If... um. Sometimes, uh, like, uh, during s some shows, like, we get um, kind of bombarded with, uh, the, basically, the chat room kind of blows up. Right. And sometimes uh, someone has a question or... Uh, I mean, there's great conversation in there that goes on all the time around what we're talking about. Right. And so we might miss the question. So we do have um, we, we do have the option to do what YouTube calls a super chat, which is um, you could give, like, a little bit of money um, to, uh, to have your question... Um, make sure that question gets to us um, so that we pay attention to it more. And does that money go to YouTube or does it go to Spooky's office? Uh, that would go to us. I'm all for this idea. <laughs> I like this idea. But, um, I mean, I, I'd be curious just to, um, uh, for like some feedback, if you guys are opposed to it, if you guys would be for it, or any ideas that you would have um, for our Patreon, maybe. Yeah, we're definitely looking for ideas for the Patreon because... Like, we just, we think that we suck. So we're like, we don't really know what people are going to want to donate money for. Uh, but some of the ideas that we've kicked around include... I know everybody wants a shirt. Everybody wants t-shirts. I know, t -shirts. I know. And we've got to work <laughs> on getting that done. T-shirts, bumper stickers, we're gonna, a Matt Moniz poster. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> but we're going to work on getting the uh, the spooky gear going this mm -hmm. winter because Dark Side Inc. is always, uh, always willing to work with us. So we'll come up with some ideas. And, and it'll, it'll be one of those things where you'll place an order... And you'll have to allow six to eight weeks of delivery because we're going to have to collect the money and then order them because we're broke. And then we'll be able to ship them all out. And then whatever profit we make, we'll keep in the bank and we'll use to order more. And then it can go on in perpetuity. But see, what happened is last time that we had T-shirts, that was the idea. Mm -hmm. And then somebody decided to start handing them out like they were the bumper stickers. Who's that? 
Uh, that wasn't me, right? No, that was All the right, uh, right. the Oprah Winfrey of Spooky South Coast here. You get a T-shirt, you get a T-shirt, everybody yeah. gets a T-shirt. But we couldn't say anything because you fronted the money for them, so you know. Right. But uh, we're gonna try and we're gonna try and get that stuff going back. Right. Got but, the word out there. But we are also looking for ideas of what you would want for the Patreon. So what I'm what I'm thinking is, you know, people complain that sometimes it takes a little while for the show to get uploaded to you to to mm-hmm. to our audio uh, podcast feed, which is true. So one of the options is, you know, very low level subscription. You'd be able to get an instant download of the show as soon as the show is over. As soon as I pull it off the station skimmer and send it to myself for later polishing up and submitting for the podcast feed, we'll send it to you as well. So you're going to get the raw, uncut audio. Not that we ever cut content out, but, you know, we cut out commercials and bumpers and anything like that. Right. You'll get the raw, uncut audio delivered to you as soon as the show is over. Within the first hour mm-hmm. after the show is over. So that's one of the things that we talked about. Another thing is, uh, you know, live weekly chats. Right. I don't know why anybody would want to do that, but people nope. ask for it. A lot of people want to pick your brain. They do. And uh, so we would, you know, set up like a, a Skype or something mm-hmm. where you'd be able to join in and, and interact and, uh, you know, I'd, I'd probably commit to doing it pretty much every week. But once in a while, we'll grab some of the other spooky crew and bring them in as well. Uh, what were some of the other ideas that we had? Anything that was worth um, mentioning? I had the idea of um, have if um, for our Patreon subscribers to have um, access to a um, like an HD stream that would be a better quality than the regular stream that we put out. Something oh, yeah, that's yeah, like yeah, that's... about like equivalent to CD quality. Of the, of the podcast, right, right? Not the stream. Right. The, yeah. the podcast. You'd get a higher quality podcast. Uh, Sudan name is mentioned in Cafe Press. <laughs> no. We, we, we we did use them for a, yes. for a while, but um, one one wash in with those t-shirts. And in fairness, that was like 2006. That's true. The they, quality maybe, maybe may be they, better, but in 2006, it was terrible. Right. Like we actually told people to stop ordering from stuff in the store. Right. Because we right. tried to shut down the shop and it wouldn't let us. Yeah. So like, just like, don't buy anything because uh, it was so bad. My my first uh, spooky South Coast shirt just disintegrated in, in the wash. Yep. It was terrible. Like it would be one thing if like the shirt stayed okay and like just the logo came off. Right. But it, it, this was like the, the sleeve was falling off. Yeah. It was just ridiculous. Yeah. Like this shirt that I'm wearing now is probably what? 2010 we got these. Right. Yeah. It still holds up. So it's seven... A little faded, Seven but it's, I old. mean, it's the, the, um, the print's still there. And it still fits. I mean, I got fatter, but the shirt still, <laughs> the shirt stayed the same. It didn't shrink at all. Right. And, uh, so it's certainly, you know, this is, this is why we go with Dark Side Inc. The quality is there. When you buy a shirt from Dark Side Inc., it's going to be something that's going to last you a long time. It's not like Cafe Press where you're going to buy one $25 t-shirt. And also, that's the other thing too, is we're able to keep the prices more affordable through Dark Side Inc. than we were through Cafe Press. Because Cafe Press, if we sell a shirt for, you know, $25, they're getting like 20 of it. Right. So it's just, it's, this, this is way better. So uh, there's, but that's, that's all right. Suit on name. I appreciate the help, but we have, uh-huh. we have a friend. Right. We, we have somebody that we work with. And uh, I think uh, Trex, Trex, Trex. Um, the, the uh, vendor that we were talking about was um, Dark Side Inc. Yes. Um, you can, you can Google, Google it. Yeah. Uh, it's Vinny, what, what's his last Vin name? Pacheco. Vin Pacheco on Facebook. Anybody that goes to paranormal conventions, they know right. Vin Pacheco. You'll know him. Because you, you'll you'll recognize him from the mustache and the sunglasses and the 10,000 rings that he has <laughs> on. He loves yeah. to wear his own product. Yeah, yeah. And, but that's the thing, like, with, with us, like, yeah, there's a lot of ways to, to do things uh, cheaper and easier and faster online. But we also like to try to work with people. And when we have friends that can do things, we want to make sure that we bring in our friends as well. Look at all the paranormal right. work. Supporting sp- Vin- small business. Remember when you went and picked up these t-shirts and Vinny was like, oh, ghost hunting? I'd like to get into that. Right, yeah. And now look at him. Yeah. You know, he's around. He's doing more stuff than we and are. And I think you uh, you hooked him up with the Taps Paramag. I did, yes. And then Back in the from Dizzy. there. Back in the Dizzy. It just went off. Now, <laughs> now Dark Side Inc. is the go-to yep. paranormal printer. They forgot about printer. <laughs> 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 Well, we love you, Vinny. All right, well, why don't we take a break? We'll get our guest, Andrea Akita, on the phone. We'll come back in just a few minutes with some more. Uh, do you want to take a break, or do you want to just go in the other room and call? It's up to you. Why don't you just go in the other room and call, because I don't have any commercials to play. I was going to have to fake my way through a break. You got the number, right? All right. So, uh, and again, if you want to call in at any point during the show, 508-996-0500. 877-996-1420. Those are the numbers to be able to call in, but you can also 
type in your question uh, via the chat room at YouTube. We have our Spooky South Coast YouTube channel up and running, and things seem to be going pretty good. And uh, also, you can tweet it to us at SpookySC or by using the hashtag SpookyLive. I'm going to keep checking that as well throughout the course of the show. You can email us, SpookyCrew at SpookySouthCoast.com. There's no excuse if you want to get involved in the conversation. There's no excuse not to do so. But, of course, the best way is a good old-fashioned way by calling in at 508-996-0500. And we have these numbers up on SpookySouthCoast.com. We have them up uh, with the feed as well on, on the YouTube So as we get into this discussion, and I I think we're going to get pretty in-depth, I think we're going to get pretty intricate in some of the things that we talk about tonight. If you enjoyed last week's show with uh, Jeffrey Kripal, we're going to go even deeper, I think, with a lot of the topics that we discussed last week. And I just happened to see a tweet from Chris Balzano on Twitter where he mentioned that uh, him and Dr. Keita had a a couple of hours long conversation so I can only imagine that with tonight's show going until midnight, we're only going to hit the tip of the iceberg with all the things that we have to talk about. So why don't I bring on our guest right now? Uh, let me give you a little bit of her bio. Andrea Akita is a folklorist with a specialty in medicine, belief, and the supernatural. She is also interested in internet folklore, narrative, and contemporary or urban legend. Her current research includes vaccines, pandemic illness, contagion and contamination, stigmatized diseases, disability, health information on the internet, and Slenderman. She is co-editor of the journal Contemporary Legend, a scholarly journal published annually by the International Society for Contemporary Legend Research. And uh, she has numerous other credentials as well that we can talk about during the show. Uh, Good evening, Dr. Kida. Are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Great to have you on. Uh, Thank you for joining us tonight. How are you? Yes, great to be here. Well, I have to say, very, very impressive credentials. And as I said to, to Matt Cost at the beginning of the show, we had uh, Jeffrey Kripal on last week, who's a, a professor. We have you on today. Like, we're really classing up the joint now with, That's with academia. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I first of all, one of the things that I've always loved about mm-hmm. – uh, you know, our, our mutual friend, Chris Balzano, is I call him an analytical folklorist, as somebody who yeah. he takes the stories and he breaks them down and figures out what they all mean. And I love yeah. somebody such as yourself that can do that, that can look at a story and realize that it's it's more than just the story. Yeah, absolutely. There's so much more there. I mean, you know, that's one thing that I think drives every folklorist crazy is when people say that something's like just folklore and it's like, oh, no, there's so much more stuff there. Like, you don't even know, um, you know, how many layers are at everything, which is what's so exciting about talking to guys like you because you kind of get it. So, <laughs> Well, I mean, I suppose, though, it, it, at, the, at the forefront of all of this, uh, folklore has to be a good story. I mean, there has to be a good story for it to get shared and for it to get passed around and for it to have meaning. There has to at least be something that is entertaining, engaging, gripping about the story itself. Yeah. Is is yeah, there absolutely? I mean, is there any kind of? I mean, is is there any kind of trick to that? Is there is there any? Obviously, you can play on people's emotions as a good way to to get people to yeah. to fall into a story. Yeah, you know, there's there's no one single trick for sure. Um, I think things just have to be kind of the right place, right time in a lot of ways. And and we do see failures of that all the time. Um, So we'll actually hear like something will start kind of becoming a story and then it just gets dropped off because, you know, something about it just doesn't work. Um, And the the sort of classic example I always use like in classes and stuff is um, right after 9-11, there was very briefly this story that Jackie Chan was supposed to be in the Twin Towers. And it didn't take off because everybody was like, no, Jackie Chan seems like a really nice guy. Like, what would he have to do with any of this? And, you know, so it was like it was there for this really brief period of time. But then all these other stories that were around there, like that there were no um, uh, tabs around the Twin Towers right after, like on, on 9-11 or that there were, you know, there's all these other sort of stories that, that kind of seemed more real. So, of course, then they caught on in a lot of different ways. But that was one of the ones that just got dropped because it just didn't feel right. Right. So we see that happen all the time. Something starts off and it sounds like it's a pretty good story, but then things change and it, it gets dropped. Well, and also it can, uh, you know, it'll also morph too as well, I'm sure, where, you know, mm-hmm. the, the story, if, I mean, for example, you know, uh, just talking urban legend stuff, you know, you might hear that mm-hmm. uh, uh, a certain celebrity did something 
lewd and ended up having to go to the hospital and and then yeah. but then it turns out it's not that person but then people start telling about another person you know i'm thinking about you know richard gear having gerbils up his ass oh, exactly. and things like that you're yeah. going to richard gear aren't you yeah well i was also thinking the the i, I didn't want to get into it because it's a little too graphic for for terrestrial radio but the whether or not it was rod whether it was rod stewart or mick jagger that had to have his stomach pumped nobody's really sure yeah, exactly. There's so many stories that, yeah, it, it ends up being a very transferable story because, you know, there's something about it that's believable. And that's something we always look for when we're talking about contemporary or urban legends. We look for something that sounds like it could be true. And that's the stuff that really sticks around. It's that, that thing that has that, like, little bit of, like, well, you know, maybe they could have been that person. So. And I, and I love that because mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if it's true. And I know that that sounds terrible mm -hmm. because, you know, you would hate to think that people are making things up about these people. But it doesn't have yeah. to be true for it to, to grip people's minds and to get them to talk about it. It just has to have enough of that, like, well, maybe it is. And, you know, you weren't there. You can't say that it wasn't true. Yeah, exactly. So that, that believability is important, but it is true, though, that sometimes folklore is true. Like, so sometimes people kind of equate the, the term folklore with things that are automatically false, but not always. You know, sometimes it is true. Um, and that's what kind of makes it interesting to look into, because, you know, when you first start to hear these things, there's, there is that believability element. And even as a folklorist, as someone who studies this stuff, you, you have that pause where you're like, okay, well, you know, I better look into this, because maybe that did actually happen. So... Well, just doing a little bit of amateur etymology here, I would say that folklore mm -hmm. is kind of, I would say it's like stories of, of the people and that these are stories mm -hmm. that were shared amongst people. Was there, was there a counter balance to that? Was there something that folklore was kind of like the, you know, the, the, the amateur version of, was there a, a more formalized storytelling that wouldn't maybe have the same themes? Yeah, you know, I always think of, of folklore as being sort of the unofficial. Um, it, it's the, it is the counter-narrative to the dominant narrative in a lot of different ways. So, you know, that's where I think it is. is um, a lot of the times when I, I do my, like, sort of quick definition of folklore, I, I talk about how it's informal knowledge. It's all the stuff you know you know, but you don't know how you know it. So, <laughs> and I think that's a, a kind of a good way of looking at it, because there is that, that sense of authority and this being sort of a counter-narrative to authority at times. But not always. You know, sometimes it, it is um, a story that hasn't heard frequently, but it's, um, it is kind of, in some ways, counter to that dominant narrative. Um, so, and that's part of what makes it interesting, too, is that, that it's um, something different than what we normally hear. But there, there doesn't have to be, it, it, it doesn't have to be something that is uh, purposely, uh, you know, counterculture. It doesn't have to be something that's purposely no. going against the, that main narrative. It can just be, it, it's almost like I look at it like uh, as if you, you know, you watch a story on the news and two mm -hmm. people are sitting there watching this, this CNN news report. And then somebody turns mm -hmm. to the other person in the room and says, well, actually, you know what I heard? And it's kind of like that same idea of it's taking that story and kind of putting a, a different twist or a different emphasis on it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that, and we're affected by that in so many different ways. Um, like even in that, that kind of the scenario you're talking about, um, someone's going to at times tell personal experience narratives, things that actually happened to them. Um, other times they're going to tell urban legends because it's something that they've heard. And they, it sounds like something that could be true. So there's so many options in that case that, that, you know, all things that qualify as folklore, but maybe, you know, aren't, aren't necessarily part of that dominant narrative or, or sort of sometimes counter and sometimes not. Is, is there a, uh, I'm trying, I'm just trying to picture in my head, you know, not only yeah. the, the current way of taking it, but also kind of through history as well. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's always been those who are storytellers, people whose job mm -hmm. it was to pass along uh, stories from, from one generation to the next and from one people to the next. But it seems like folklore is for everybody. It's a story that anybody can tell anyone. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, um, that's part of the greatest part about being a folklorist is, you know, we know a lot about the structure and the narrative. We do all the analysis. But the people who actually tell us the stories are the experts. We're not the experts. Everyone is the expert. Um, and that's the coolest part about folklore is that it's something that we all engage in on some level. Like, we've all engaged in it in some point. Um, or we're currently engaging in it right now. Um, so that's what is so cool because, like, like, especially when I teach in class, you know, there's no other class that my students can walk into and already be an expert. Um, but they are an expert in folklore. Um, they know all of this stuff already. I just have to, to talk to them about a different way of thinking about it and a different way of analyzing it. 
Well, and that is kind of, uh, you know, people tell these stories throughout their whole lives, but they don't take a step back mm -hmm. and, and think about the meaning and, and, and what it is that they're doing in telling the story. You know, everybody, we, we do what we call legend tripping, where we, mm -hmm. and, and I'm sure that you talked about that at length with, with Chris, where, you know, we're going out there and we're trying to just put ourselves into these stories and then share those experiences with other people. And that by doing that, we become part of the story. And with, yeah, absolutely. with folklore, isn't anybody that tells the story kind of just adding a, a piece to it somewhere along the line? Absolutely, because every story is different. And the way that people tell it, um, I mean, people constantly change the story. They add a little bit to it. They take a little bit away from it. So that story is just constantly being modified and changed. And it, it make, it's being made more relevant a lot of times, too. So there's, like, there's versions of, of stories that we have that are so incredibly old, um, but we've just modernized them in a lot of different ways. So, like, I often think of, like, all the stories that you used to hear about, like, remember, like, your grandparents and everything telling you, like, you sat too close to the TV and it was going to give you cancer? Yes. Um, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Um, we hear not now about cell phones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, it's like, you know, you know, oh, if you, you know, use something to, to keep your cell phone away from the side of your face because that's going to give you cancer. Um, or don't put it in your pocket because it'll give you cancer. Um, so, it's all the same stories. It's just about a different, newer form of technology. Um, so that's what's so cool about the stuff is that it does change and modify over time. And, I mean, ghost photography is a great example of that. Um, you know, there's all the different ways that people used to think that you could capture ghosts on film. And it was, you know, some people believe that you could be, you know, sort of imprinted on the actual physical film itself. And other people believe that it was the energy that came through um, the electronics itself. Um, so we've kind of constantly changed our perception of, even with something like that, how it actually works. Um, but it's all kind of tied into a, like the sort of larger, older story of this is how these things work, right? Absolutely. See, and what we do is we also, as a people, we overcome some of those those things too because, you know, our grandmothers told mm -hmm. us not to sit too close to the TV, so what do we do? We just made bigger, more higher-definition TVs. <laughs> so now we sit far away, but it's still just as big. It's still just right up in our face. Exactly, right? <laughs> I don't know how to fix the cell phone cancer problem, though. I'm, I'm a little worried about my butt yeah, now. Yeah, I don't know. I, I actually, pocket. a couple of, of years ago, I had uh, a student who brought in, her mother had brought her these stickers, and you could actually put them on your cell phone, and it was supposed to help block some of the, I guess, the radioactivity. I don't know exactly what it was supposed to block. She wasn't entirely sure either, um, but she bought them for her, her daughter and all of her daughter's roommates, and they all put them on their phone because it, it didn't hurt. Right. right? <laughs> so, um, and that's one of the other things I love, too, is sometimes we don't even believe in things, but we do them anyway because it doesn't hurt. Right. right? Well, it's I mean, it's hard to, like, avoid a ladder. Um, you know, it's not hard to, you know, put a sticker on your cell phone, that kind of stuff. So we'll just do it because, you know, it, it, why not? It can't hurt. Right. Well, that's, that's what I love about superstition is that people tell you they don't believe in it, but then they do it anyway. Yeah, exactly. And and we see that all the time. People pass on beliefs they don't believe in. Like, if somebody breaks a mirror around you, regardless of whether or not you believe that seven years bad luck, you're going to say that to them, or you're at least going to think it, right? Well, I, I mean, I, 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 would, I never say that when it comes to breaking mirrors, mm -hmm. only because, mm -hmm. like, I'm so funny looking, I've probably broken more than my fair share. So I don't <laughs> worry about that. But I always thought that that idea of breaking mirrors ca came from a time mm -hmm. when mirrors were so expensive that you know uh, yeah. that it was kind of just a way to keep people from from mishandling them and, and from taking extra care when holding them you know what and there probably was something to that absolutely because they were very expensive so you wanted to be careful around them oh well i mean now they're even now they're kind of pricey because mm -hmm. i've been i've been looking for a good mirror that i can use for like a, a portable psychomantium to take some of our haunted events and like i'm looking mm -hmm. at them in the store and i'm like really it's still that much money for a mirror i'm just gonna end up breaking it yeah, exactly. It's kind of shocking, isn't it? <laughs> but I guess if it if it holds seven years worth of good luck in it, if it doesn't break, then I, I yeah, guess... Yeah, you know, uh, there you go. You know, it's, so it's that's worth what it's it. worth. <laughs> yeah, divide it by seven and you're only paying, you know, 10 bucks a year. It's not that bad. <laughs> we'd, we'd pay that. So... Taking a look at your uh, your credentials and your background, it, mm -hmm. it, it obviously yeah. uh, medicine is a big focus for you. Um, yeah. How does the world of medicine and folklore cross with each other? Oh, you know what? It does it all the time. And, and one of the things I'm the most interested in is um, especially how urban legends affect people's medical decision making. So if they hear a story about something, does that actually affect the decisions they make about medicine? So I think when a lot of people hear folk medicine, they always think of like the older stuff, like old remedies for things. And, and that's certainly part of it as well. 
Um, but I'm really interested in like the really modern stuff. So like how does, and you know, my specialty is the anti-vaccination movement. So how does it, all of these stories about how like the MMR vaccine causing autism, how does it actually affect people's decision whether or not to get their children the MMR vaccine? Um, so I think that's really, really interesting, fascinating stuff because there's so much research out there. Um, and especially now that, that uh, you know, terms like fake news have become really popular. I was like, wow, guys, no, that was around for, that's been around forever. And I could, I saw it all over the place with alternative health websites. And some of them have, you know, good, decent information, but some are terrible and they, they don't have good information on them. Um, but that still affects how people decide um, what they're going to do when it comes to you know, am I going to take this medication? Am I going to take this vaccine? Um, so there's both good and bad about it because, you know, the Internet has given us also this space where we can research our own health conditions. We can um, connect with other people who have similar conditions, which is really great. Um, it also gives us a lot of access, especially for people who maybe were not able to participate in a lot of these conversations before. They can now participate. Um, because they have the access um, via the Internet. So it's such an interesting place to look at how health and belief really affect people's everyday lives. So it's just fascinating. I mean, it really is. Like, it's it's people are getting to the point where they're mm -hmm. starting to believe in the power of belief when it comes to their own health more than, you know, it's almost like it's cyclical with the way that we would have felt mm -hmm. with spiritualism, you know, hundreds of years ago. And now it's kind of coming back full circle where, yeah, medicine is great and medicine helps, but we also want to try to find ways to kind of heal ourselves and to, and to believe that we like just the other night, you know, I've, I've been going through mm -hmm. a little bit of a, a health issue and I'm laying on mm -hmm. my bed and I'm visualizing, uh, you know, mm -hmm. trying to solve this problem while I'm laying there in bed. And I think people are starting to look into that more and more. Yeah, absolutely. And there's, um, especially with things like visualization, there's, there's actually some pretty good evidence that um, it can help. But that's not to say, because, you know, then the sort of other side of that is there's a sort of implication that if you can't heal yourself, you're not trying hard enough, you mm -hmm. know, and that's, that's a really negative thing to kind of say that, like, you know, if you just thought more positively or if you just tried harder, you could heal yourself. Well, obviously, that's not always true. Um, so, you know, it, there's so many different factors involved. So it is, it's so interesting to see how belief has, uh, has started to affect these things. So I think, you know, things like visualization, which have, you know, pretty good evidence are pretty great, but they don't work for everybody. Um, and then that becomes problematic too. And I, you know, I love that one of the areas that you research into is the is health information on the internet because you know just as uh, you know everybody on Facebook is a lawyer, everybody on Facebook thinks they're a doctor too. You know, everybody kind of has their, their well, this is what I do and this works for me, and you know, and then somebody mm -hmm. says it didn't work for me, well, then you must be doing it wrong. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so there there is that that sort of idea. Which is so funny because we know um, when we look at, at sort of, you know, official medicine, that not everything works for everybody, but we're not as sympathetic when it comes to alternative medicine sometimes. They're like, well, if you just tried harder, if you just did more, you would, it would work for you. It's like, well, no, of course, not everything works for everybody. Right. I can't tell you how many times like I've had something that, you know, might be wrong, something that might just be a little bit off. And, and I'll get 100 people mm -hmm. that tell me go to GNC and buy this. But everybody's telling me something different. I'm like, if I go into yeah. GNC and buy one of those things, it's more money than I'm wanting to spend, let alone buying 100 yeah. different things. Well, and that's a big part of it, too. We can't forget that sometimes these alternative health websites are linked to places where you can buy things. So they're not so much good information or even information that's trying to be helpful. They're sometimes just information that's trying to sell stuff to people. Yeah, well, that's that's the other thing, too, is, you know, we look at, especially in this genre and in, in the, the mm -hmm. alternative talk, we can say, you know, paranormal topics, strange and unusual stuff. Mm -hmm. We get a lot of these... Um, you know, these, the, st the stuff that the carnivora, the things like that, things that you're supposed to take that are going to make you feel better, things that you're going to take that are going to make you survive the coming apocalypse, you know, all these different things yeah. that are really just more hype than they are anything else. Well, and that's just it, because unfortunately, especially with things when we're talking about the paranormal and the supernatural, um, just one charlatan or one bad person can really turn everybody against it so you know just like you have good and bad physicians you have good and bad psychics you have good and bad everything right so some people are out for the money but there are other people that are genuinely trying to help people well we i guess though if 
if you can believe in something and it works for you, then it's it's worth that, even if it's just a, a placebo effect. But if it can yeah. be enough for you to buy into it, then it, it works. And I say that all the time about psychics. I, I argue my usual mm-hmm. co-host, Stephanie Burke, is a psychic mm-hmm. medium. She's she's out tonight at an event. But we argue all mm-hmm. the time about the value of people going to a bad psychic. You know, she sees yeah. it as if somebody else is doing the same job that she can do with that she's a legitimate psychic, but somebody's going to see somebody else who is just kind of cold reading them and telling them what they want to hear. I say, but there's still some value in that because if it makes the person feel better in the end, that's really all that matters. Well, that's just it. And I think we, we tend to undersell the placebo effect in a lot of different ways and including with, with things like psychics. I mean, if the end result is, does the person feel better? Well, then, you know, it's been a successful treatment to some extent, right? Um, so if, you know, somebody tries an alternative health care treatment and it works for them, well, then great. You know, maybe they're in less pain or maybe they're managing their symptoms better or maybe, you know, it, it helps them self-heal or whatever it's going to be. Um, so I don't think we should discount placebo because it, it does have some value. Now, I understand as, as you know, for someone who like is a psychic, they probably get pretty ticked off about the ones that, that you know, don't uh, yeah, sure, maybe yeah. aren't as, as ethical, of course. But but yeah, in some cases, it doesn't mean that they're necessarily, you know, all bad. Um, maybe, you know, we can we can certainly question their ethics. But um, if maybe they, they do help people, you know, and I mean, there are some cases, too, where somebody just needs to hear something. Um, you know, I talk to people that, that do this kind of stuff all the time. And, you know, sometimes they're like, yeah, I'm just here to listen and, and almost like a, a sort of amateur, you know, psychologist, just let them talk. And that's all they need. Um, in some cases, that's what they need. And, and sometimes, you know, sadly enough, psychics are sometimes cheaper than psychologists. So um, they get what they need from those people. And there's, um, there's value in that, too. And that's one of the things that we've talked about, too, is that uh, mm-hmm. Stephanie and I where. You know, some people are doing this just to go back to the psychics. You know, they're going mm-hmm. into this and, and thinking that they are legitimately psychics, even though they're not mm-hmm. really doing it right, so to speak. They yeah. have the feeling because it's kind of, you know, they've, they've bought into the idea as well. So and I think that that's part of what why this doesn't always work for everybody when it comes to some of these alternative medicines ideas, just because it worked for you. Mm-hmm. And as you said, it's not going to work for everybody. But. When it does work for you, you become so hardened in that belief that it was the right thing that you can't understand why it isn't the right thing for somebody else. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. You know, and it is. It's all about what works for people. And I don't think that, you know, if it does, if if, if in the end it it reduces suffering, then great. You know, (laughs) great. We've been successful. Now, is there... uh... I mean, there is some some downside to preying on people's, uh, you know, when, when when people aren't at their best, when people are uh, yeah. in searching for answers. There there is some mm-hmm. downside to preying on that and to trying to profit yeah. off it as well. Yeah, absolutely. And and you know, I I don't have a whole lot of uh, <laughs> time for that. I I really don't think that, especially when people are are suffering, that they should anybody should pray on that. Um, you know, I, and I think there are, there are times, you know, I've been around even other psychics and everything who have been, who have said things like, you know, I just can't read this person. And a lot of times they're like, here's your money back. Like here, you know, like uh, for some reason I can't read you. I don't know why it's just not working. Um, and I think that's, that's an honest answer, but sometimes you come across people who will say something no matter what. Um, and that's, you know, that's where we get really problematic, especially as, as the price starts to go up and up sometimes in, in some of these cases. And, you know, and that is, that's generally being a bad person, and I'm not going to support that. Um, but unfortunately, it does, it, you know, it can really harm the entire area of what they're doing or, or the benefit that they can have because of one or two bad people. Absolutely. And we see that a lot in, in the paranormal realm, mm-hmm. as, as you mentioned. It mm-hmm. only takes one person screwing it up to make people question everybody. And it only takes, you know, like for, just for example, you know, we do we do mm-hmm. paranormal events as a way to get out there and, and raise money for mm-hmm. historical places. And it just takes one person screwing over somebody for everybody yeah. to, to get looked at with the stink eye. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 
But uh, hopefully people won't mind then now that I will segue into a promotion for our next event, which is, uh, <laughs> no, uh, but we do have one actually, no, all kidding aside. Uh, if anybody wants to go to SpookySouthCoast.com, Lizzie's March to Murder, it's up there for sale. There's, there's a few tickets remaining. Uh, we are going to take a break coming up uh, in just a minute for our network news. Uh, but when we come back on the other side, I want to get more into the idea of, of some of this folklore about the supernatural, especially some of these things that have... Uh, kind of stood the test of time, which uh, a lot of these do. And, and of course, I definitely want to get into Slender Man because I know that that is something that is – it's the perfect example of how a made-up story can become something tangible. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll get into all that and more uh, coming up in just a few moments. Again, if anybody wants to call in during the show, uh, you can do so by calling in at 508-996-0500, 877-996-1420. You can tweet us your questions at SpookySC or using the hashtag SpookyLive. Email them, SpookyCrew at SpookySouthCoast.com. Uh, you can also uh, send us, uh, what was the other way that you can get? Oh, in the chat room at SpookyTV at SpookySouthCoast.com or on YouTube or however you are watching the show live. There's usually a chat room option there just type in your question i'm trying to keep up with the uh, stuff there as much as i can uh, but you know of course the the conversation always just goes off on tangents which is it's awesome that's why we have the chat room we want that to happen we want people to engage in conversations uh, but we will certainly try to keep our eyes out for some uh, for some questions there as well so we are going to take a break for the news when we come back more with our guest dr andrea akita your questions as well coming up in the next hour stay tuned for more spooky south coast 